Hi, I'm Dr. Vip Patel, uh, professor of urology at uh, UCF uh, School of Medicine and also medical director of urologic oncology. I'll be giving a talk about uh, robotic radical prostatectomy. So here I've shared my screen and um, I was asked to talk really about our experience uh, over the last uh, 18 years uh, in terms of prostatectomy in the uh, endless learning curve and all the different tips and tricks that we've learned along the way. The first prostatectomies were done uh, basically back in 1999 and uh, we did our initial cases in 2002. But I have to say what we <clears throat> started as our goal is quite different from what ended up developing. Our initial goal was to really just find a different way to do a prostatectomy that was being done open uh, or laparoscopically. And robots actually became the perfect combination of open and laparoscopic techniques. And so I think we've gone well beyond what we imagined would happen initially, because I didn't think we had imagined that 90 plus percent of all prostatectomies would be done with a robot when we first started. And I think the outcomes have also supported that. And, We've been very pleased with how we've progressed. As you can see, um, over the years, the adoptions have changed and most people in residency, fellows, and even practicing attendings are performing um, robotic prostatectomy now. Also in terms of, if you look at the national trends in terms of uh, the market size for medical robotics, as you can see, it's, uh, it's still on its upward curve and um, it's quite a large market as we're seeing medical robotics start to go into areas outside of surgery as well. So what have we learned and how did we learn it? I think that's probably the key question. 14,000 cases later, uh, we definitely have had uh, experience to know what to do and what not to do. And that's what I hope to share with you today. I think our first uh, win was uh, we, we had a database and we've, kept that database from the beginning uh, to now and we prospectively follow all of these patients for about 10 years or so. And uh, we have 300 data points per person that we collect and then we follow their outcomes after surgery. We've also published a lot of our findings, our techniques, our tips and tricks. And I think each of this has been done in an evidence-based manner. And I think that's the key. If you know what your data shows, then you know what you've learned and you know what to teach. Our initial goals uh, when we first started um, was to make sure we were safe. And uh, you have to remember this was back in the open era of surgery and there was a lot of skepticism around laparoscopy and robotics for sure. And I think most people thought it was a fad at the time. Um, however, uh, we saw some merit in the robotic technology providing superiority over both open and laparoscopic surgery. And so we embarked upon our program. And our initial goal was to make sure the complication rates were low and also that the oncologic results were good. The surrogate marker for oncologic um, cure was initially positive margins to make sure that uh, we were doing a good job technically. And then we followed these guys for many, many years, making sure we, we were keeping track of recurrences to make sure that in robotics, we were not seeing anything worse than open or laparoscopic. The other thing that we kept a close eye on was complications. Um, initially, the procedures obviously were, were long, you know, five, six hours sometimes in the first few. And these patients uh, would feel the brunt of that. And so operative time clearly is associated with complications and so we quickly uh, tried to lower our operative times and to make sure that we weren't providing any other increased morbidity or mortality. And I think overall our um, um, complication rate was actually quite low uh, overall and we've maintained that, but there's complications never go away. You know, it's the more you operate, the more you see in, in some ways. And so every now and again, you'll see a post-op bleed, usually in the most optimal patient of the day who went great and just randomly he'll have a bleed. Uh, you'll see, still see deep vein thrombosis, 
homoembolus, ileus, and of course, uh, lymphocele formation. These are the things that we see most commonly and have not really gone away. Margins overall have stayed pretty stable uh, over, over the years. Um, we haven't seen any large spikes. And what's been beneficial in that is that, uh, you know, the oncology of the tumors we're seeing are much worse now and will continue to get worse but the margins have stayed stable. And that's because we've adopt, adjusted our technique and we've gone from performing more full nerve sparing to more partial nerve sparing as we see the, the oncology of the tumor and the amount of extra capsular extension getting worse. So it's been a, a decade, almost two decades now of evolving this technique and, and amassing the knowledge uh, uh, from these patients I think these are some of the technical modifications that we've performed um, over the years. Um, as we operate, um, as we change things, we always keep in mind the complications, the positive surgical margins, and obviously the trifecta and the pentafecta outcomes. And here you see some of the techniques um, that we have incorporated into our procedure over the years. Uh, the majority of these are still a, a key part of our surgical technique. And each of these was done in an evidence-based manner, um, making sure that we followed these patients, we looked at the data, and we analyzed them academically, and then we published them. Urinary continence, uh, this was one of the first things we looked at to see if uh, robotically, laparoscopically, we could uh, get our, our uh, recovery uh, back faster. Um, our bladder neck reconstruction, our suspension stip, stitch, and our posterior reconstruction called the Rocco stitch were all um, parts of our operation. And when we incorporated them along the way, um, and we've published the data showing the influence. Urinary continence, I always say, is predictably unpredictable. And uh, it's, it's harder to predict than most things. Um, you could have the, the worst medical candidate and obese patient and they could be dry you know day one and then you can have a triathlete who's super fit and they can take six to twelve weeks and a lot of this is related to the pelvic floor and the operation the good thing is um, at one year most of the results are quite good published in the literature continence rates are very very good it's really the short-term continence that is uh, somewhat variable these are some of the key continence mechanisms um, that uh, are responsible for urinary continence. And these are some of the things that we actually uh, cut or destroy during prostatectomy. And so I think it's important to notice uh, and know um, the key structures and what's disrupted during prostatectomy because then you can actually reconstruct and put these things back together so that your long-term continence and your long-term pelvic floor is, is suitable for continence. Our suspension stitch is uh, being still used by, by most and basically what it does is it uh, recreates the uh, pubo-prostatics. Uh, the pubo-prostatics and pubo-urethrals are often uh, sacrificed uh, during prostatectomy and this basically suspends it up to the pubic bone and allows you to cut your dorsal vein, which it ligates, and it keeps the suspension, keeps the anterior urethra suspended. And we showed that there was an improvement in early continence using this. The posterior reconstruction um, was started by uh, Bernardo Rocco and his father, and we modified it for robotic surgery together. And uh, this has become a, a staple of our surgical procedure. It provides good hemostasis, it approximates the tissue, and it brings the bladder down very nicely. And so it makes the anastomosis easier as well. So this is a key part of our procedure, and I think it's very important. And it's also obviously helpful in continence. This is how our procedure really looks uh, these days. Um, we've decided to do, on patients who don't have anterior tumors, apical tumors, we've decided to do a modified apical dissection um, whereby the apical complex and the pubo-prostatics are minimally uh, disturbed. And I think that keeps the urethra suspended and attached to the um, lateral ligaments. 
And then when we're doing a full nerve spray on a low risk patient, we do a lateral prostatic fascia dissection where the lateral prostatic fascia is still left on the patient. And therefore, obviously the nerve bundles are also left intact. And so this is how it looks uh, today. One of the key parts to doing this different kind of apical dissection is uh, you're not going as far back on the pubic prosthetics. And so you're less likely to get these vessels that are coming in and innovating the sphincter and you're being a little bit more precise on how you uh, ligate the tissue. And so you're, you're gonna have less um, issues with vasculature coming into the urethra and potentially re devascularizing the urethra or the, um, the pelvic floor. Here's another very important thing. Uh, as you can see, the prostate's removed. The nerve bundles are down there very deep. You can see them here. And then as you come back, you can see two large accessory pudendal arteries. And these are important. Um, they are quite large on both sides. They should be saved because they provide a large portion of the blood supply to the corpora. So if you do a great nerve sparing, but you ligate these arteries, there's a good chance we're gonna get vasculogenic impotence on top of the neuropraxia from the surgery. So I think the prostatectomy really is a, an anatomical neurosurgical um, operation in many ways, as you have key nerves and vasculature all intimately involved with the prostate. And so I think the key is how we've evolved our technique to preserve the nerves during robotic prostatectomy. As you can see here, this is one of the Walsh diagrams and it shows the arteries and the veins and whether the um, vesicle plexus is in relation to the neurovascular bundle and the rectum. And what you can see is right at the base of the prostate, the, um, the nerve bundle is intimately um, intact with the prostate capsule. And so when you're saving these nerves, you have to basically peel them off the prostate capsule. And this becomes obviously a challenge in bigger tumors and if they have extra capsule extension. Also in low volume disease, you want to stay out of the capsule, making sure you don't leave any prostatic tissue and also not cause any positive surgical margins. So I think neurovascular bundle preservation is, is the challenge and uh, it's, it's what we do. Um, it can be transected, it can be crushed, it can be burned and it can be stretched. And so traction injury is important. You know, you can do the most perfect nerve sparing in the world, the prostate looks great, the nerve bundle looks great, but if you've caused a lot of trauma from traction, um, you're gonna have a neuropraxia. And that's gonna lead to some issues um, in recovery of potency. So it's very important not only to technically save the bundle, but not to damage it as you're saving it. And so I think uh, an athermal dissection minimizing the traction, making sure that we um, save the full bundle from base to apex is very important. But obviously it's easier said than done. Um, the neurovascular bundle preservation I think still is difficult for most surgeons and is still a challenge for us. And I think our techniques are looking at trying to basically extract the bundle away from the prostate in the least um, damaging manner and that's important but what's also important is that you know not all nerves are meant to be spared or not all neurovascular bundle portions are supposed to be spared because of the oncology of the tumor there are times when these cancers do go through the capsule and where do they go they go right to the neurovascular bundle and so sometimes a partial nerve sparing is better for the patient than a full nerve sparing so this is how we like to do our procedure, you know, making sure we save the whole nerve bundle from the uh, <clears throat> apex to the base, uh, preserving the accessory structures, the fascial attachments, the apical and lateral attachments, and then to minimize traction and coagulation and to do a good nerve sparing without destroying other things. And we like to do it also in a retrograde grade manner. And what we mean here is we do an anti-grade prostatectomy 
we like to really release the nerve bundle from below <clears throat> and then actually go anterior and get in between the plane of the prostate and the nerve bundle and go retrograde all the way to the base of the prostate and then place the clips to uh, free the prostate. And what this does is it gives us a better plane to get the, fully, the full nerve bundle exposed and dissected. And it also prevents us from getting into those big uh, veins and arteries that are anterior on the prostate capsule. So this is what um, we'd like to see at the end. The prostate's removed, you have a nice urethra, and you have what we call these train tracks here. Um, basically, these are neurovascular bundles with arteries, veins, nerves uh, on each side of the prostate, and they've, they've been released and the prostate's been extracted. <clears throat> this is a video here where underneath the prostate, the seminal vesicle and the prostate are up, neurovascular bundle here is being dissected on the right side, the rectum is down, and what we're doing is with 30 degree up lens, uh, we're basically getting into that nice plane between the prostate capsule and the prostate fascia and the lateral prostatic fascia. The goal is basically to get in between them into that nice avascular plane and to go anteriorly up the prostate and therefore it will make us easier to do the dissection when we go anterior. And so we do this on both sides. Obviously the nerve bundles are on both sides and they both need to be preserved. And so you do this on a <clears throat> patient who's uh, low risk, someone who is, uh, um, has disease that is amenable for a good nerve sparing uh, procedure. So here you can see we've, we've done the 30 degree up dissection. Now we go ahead and switch and we'll go 30 degree down and we'll do our anterior dissection. And the goal is to try and connect the two. Um, we've done it here. You can see the, the nerve bundle is fully exposed and dissected off of the prostate. And then what we do is we come in a retrograde manner and come all the way down to the, the pedicle and the base of the prostate. Uh, the reason this is important is, is the fact that the prostate's attached prevents us from getting too much traction on the nerve bundles and it keeps them in place. Also at the base of the prostate, look how close that nerve bundle is to the, um, to the um, base of the prostate and the pedicle. And so the only way to truly know where it is is to first dissect off the nerve bundles and then at the base of the prostate, put those clips very, very specifically in the right place. And that's where the retrograde nerve spray really helps make a difference here. And you can see the train tracks right here. <clears throat> But our technical approach uh, has still evolved uh, to a different level, I think, now. And, and what we do is, um, instead of just releasing those um, nerve bundles, we now try to leave the lateral prosthetic fascia intact on the patient's side. And what that does is it gives you a, a new plane that is uh, closer to the prostate, uh, marginally but the nerve bundles are lateral. We don't see the train tracks anymore because they're buried behind the lateral prosthetic fascia. And therefore, um, our belief is that by doing that, we're less likely to touch the nerve bundle because we don't see it, and we're more likely to preserve it uh, fully, and we're less likely to cause traction and trauma because it's all lateral to our working field. And so we recently published this, and what we're showing is an earlier return of continence and potency in our patients. So as you can see on the left here, this is the traditional train tracks. Um, but on the right, you don't see them at all, not because there's no nerve bundles there, but because they're buried behind the lateral prosthetic fascia. You can see you don't see the levators the same way. You just basically see a cavity, and that cavity is lined by the prosthetic fascia. <clears throat> so here, once again, we have a, uh, uh, the seminal vesicles are up, the rectum is down. We've gone 30 degree up again with the camera, and we're gonna basically drop the rectum, drop the nervous fascia off of the prostate, and get into this nice plane. And you can see the tissue layers of the fascia peeling off. That's the lateral prostatic fascia that's attached to the prostate. And our goal is basically to peel that off and to leave the nerve bundles lateral. You don't even see the nerve bundles here because they're buried behind this fascial layer, and therefore, I think they're less likely to be traumatized. We do the same thing on both sides. And then once again, we'll go anterior and I'll show you that 
now. And so we've done the dissection posteriorly and now anteriorly. You can see we're much more medial. The endopelvic fascia is intact there laterally. We don't see the levators. And so this is a low risk patient. Obviously we're trying to do a high end nerve sparing here. This is not for all patients, but definitely for low risk patients. And you see that the, the left side, sorry, the right side here looks different. You don't see the levators. You see we haven't opened that fascia. There's less traction, less trauma because everything's attached. And we can see that the nerve bundles are not visible uh, anymore. Here at the end of the video, we actually show this fascial layer nicely. We can see here that, that uh, no train tracks, no nerve bundles are visible. <clears throat> but we can see that this is where the fascial layer is on both sides and there we'll grab it. So this is the lateral prostatic fascia. We've gone medial to it and left the nerve bundles and everything lateral to, to that. And so slightly different uh, technique. This is the prostatic fascia layer. We don't see the levators anymore, but you can see the levators are lateral to this fascial layer. And that's what makes the difference. Functional outcomes, we've seen a uh, nice improvement in potency and incontinence. Um, so this is what we're doing at this time. We didn't see any um, increase in positive margin rates, which is very important to us because we are in a different surgical plane, uh, but we also selected these patients very, very carefully. Can we predict who's gonna have the optimal outcome? I think that was one of my questions to our fellows is, you know, what makes the difference in potency? Is if the surgeon is constant, which is me, and our you know, what, what a patient characteristics make a difference. And, and so what we found was that uh, age was a huge influencer, the shim score and the, um, the type of nerve spring. So the shim, pre-op shim score was the most important. Uh, if they were good potency before and they had a tumor amenable to a nerve spring, they just did very, very well. Um, age was second most important followed by the actual technical part of the nerve sparing. So these were all very, very important factors for us. A full nerve sparing had better outcomes than a partial, that makes sense. Um, but with everything else constant, shim score was important followed by age. You can see here the effect of different types of nerve sparing, a full versus a intermediate versus a non, uh, makes a pretty big difference. Um, our non nerve sparing um, was some type of nerve spring, we just said it was less than 50% of the bundle uh, based on our opinion. So that's why you have a little bit of potency there is some patients, especially younger ones, you can take half the nerve bundles and they can still come back. So the key factors, age, shim score, type of nerve sparing was, was very, very important. Um, patients of all ages with no ED and a full nerve sparing had excellent potency results. So what you can say is, even if patients are older, if they're amenable to a good nurse spare oncologically, you should save the nurse because regardless of age, they can still come back. Obviously the younger guys come back faster and more, more often, but the old patients, they can still be fine. So what it tells us really is that if you get optimal patients, uh, the, the trifecta is very possible. And I think we found that with our experience, there are certain patients we we're just gonna have good results because they're younger, they have uh, less disease, so they're good amenable for a full nurse spare. And that's what we're able to do and the shim scores are good. And so when we looked at our optimal patients, we found that the trifecta outcomes were very good in these patients. But there is a challenge there. You know, it's the oncology of the tumor has changed. We are seeing more high risk disease, more extra capsular extension. And so this can be a challenge when you're looking at potency results and nerve sparing. And not all nerves are meant to be saved. Uh, some people, you know, more than 50% of our patients now have extra capsular extension of some sort. And therefore the, the nerve bundles are, are at risk and so we have to balance the, uh, the oncologic versus the, the potency part of the operation. And this is what we've seen uh, from, from my, my first cases at Celebration in Orlando to now, 
each year we see more and more high risk patients, T3 or more in that uh, trend seems to be continuing. So when we look back at our patients, we're seeing that uh, all the negative uh, parts of the pathology are increasing, such as some of vesicle invasion, lymphovascular invasion, um, extra prostatic extension. And so we actually looked at this to see what's going on. And we looked at the, uh, the cut point of 2012. We looked at patients before and after that. And uh, the reason we used 2012 was that's when the U.S. Preventative Task Force uh, recommended against PSA screening. And so obviously we saw a change in the type of patient coming to see us after that. After 2012, more active surveillance, so those patients weren't coming to us. But overall, the, the aggressiveness of the disease has definitely changed. And so what we're finding is that uh, there's definitely a, a change in, in patients that are coming to us, changes in referral patterns, and obviously our experience has increased as well. And what we found is that after 2012, the, the aggressiveness of the disease was more than what was presenting to us and what we were seeing in the post-op pathology. It was definitely an increase in adverse pathology, um, decreasing the amount of full nerve sparing, and that was a response to the adverse pathology. We were seeing people with bulky tumors, extension on MRI, clinically T2 disease. Uh, we were just seeing much more high-risk patients um, than we were before 2012. And so in response to keep our margins appropriate and our recurrence rates low, we had to adjust our nerve sparing uh, to match that. And so after 2012, there has been an increase in the rate of unfavorable pathologic characteristics. There's less full nerve spraying. There's less optimal candidates for our operation. And so we do just as many partial nerve sparings as we do full nerve sparings. And it's all based upon the tumor. So the question next is, you, we, we saw how to do a full nerve sparing. You know, how do you do a partial? And especially if you're cutting into a neurovascular structure. Um, isn't it an all or nothing thing? And I guess the answer is no, you, you can do a partial nerve spraying and you can do it uh, well, um, but you do have to be careful and you do have to have some good experience to do that. So this is a paper we wrote about uh, the all or none uh, concept of nerve spraying is gone. Now it's more about graded types of nerve spraying between 100%, 25, 50, 75, there is a variability in terms of nerve sparing. In order to do that, we first had to figure out how to know how much disease is outside of the prostate and where. And when we looked at the nomograms we were using, such as the Parton nomogram, um, it would tell us the chance of extra capsule extension for a patient, but not the side that it was gonna be out or the location or the amount. And so that wasn't quite helpful. You know, We didn't wanna do a wide resection on every patient who had a chance of extra capsule extension because the majority of it was one millimeter, two millimeters. Um, and so we had to come up with a different model. And so with uh, Bernardo's Rocco's group in Italy, we, we took 12,000 lobes of prostate and analyzed them for extra capsule extension and then came up with our own uh, nomogram to predict extra capsule extension, site specific, and the amount. So you can see here this patient, the left lobe has disease, but it's uh, relatively low volume. And so you can do a full nurse pair here, everything is green. Whereas on the right side here, uh, you see that you have to go at least two millimeters out, otherwise, you're in a chance for getting a positive margin because of the location of the extra capsule extension here um, on the right uh, mid and base. And so you can look online, uh, the Pressy nomogram, uh, you can uh, plug your data in and you should do this on all the patients before surgery so you know the risk of extra capsule extension in these patients. So once you know um, how much uh, extra capsule extension and where it's going to be, um, how do you translate into surgery the ability to know 
where the structures are and how much you're taking. And so we, we presented that to uh, one of our fellows, Dr. Shetloff, and um, we asked him to analyze how we were doing the nerve sparing. And then we actually had the pathologist uh, also corroborate that. And what we found is we were using certain um, anatomical landmarks to save the nerves. And our pathologist was saying that we were relatively accurate when we were saving 100%, 50%, 75% as he looked at the specimens. But I think the anatomical landmarks and the, uh, the surgical planes were key. And what we found is there are certain vessels coming off the prostate and there's a prostatic artery. And these arteries are very common in the neurovascular bundle on both sides. And we were using them as landmarks to um, really say what part of extension or what part uh, we were saving. So here, this is the uh, right side of the prostate. You can see there's an anterior medial artery, a posterior medial artery, and a lateral artery. And you have to be medial to all of those vessels in order to get a full nerve sparing. If you start to take those vessels, you start to do more of a partial nerve sparing instead of a full nerve sparing. And we found that if the medial vessels here were taken, you know, up to 50% of the nerve bundle was compromised on a histologic exam. So here's your posterior medial artery. We're looking 30 degree up on the underside of the prostate. <clears throat> and you can see here, it's a very robust artery. If you're medial to that, you're in the plane for a full uh, nerve sparing on that side. Whereas if you're lateral to that, you're probably gonna take about 50% of the nerve vascular bundle. <clears throat> in cases like this, where you have extension outside the prostate, uh, you're gonna do a aggressive partial nerve sparing. And what we found is if you're lateral to these vessels, you have at least a three millimeter clearance from the capsule. And what's important here is um, at least 85% of extra capsular extension is within three millimeters of the prostate capsule. And so these arteries are important and can help oncologically. <clears throat> so here we can see that uh, the arteries uh, intact there, it's on the prostate. We've gone medial to it, sorry, we've gone lateral to it. And, but you can still see there's a good portion of the neurovascular bundle there. And probably, you know, in this case, 50 to 75% of the neurovascular bundle is still preserved and intact. But we do have some cushion on the lateral border of the prostate because it's still covered by the artery, the fascia, and therefore that allows us to get a negative margin. Uh, but still doing a partial nerve sparing and still leaving plenty of nerve tissue behind. So, so these are some of our, our key tips and tricks. Um, as you can see, um, you know, 14,000 cases later, um, the learning curve is, is endless. And uh, I think um, we continue to learn, we continue to strive to do better and help our patients. Um, there's no 100% in terms of potency, continence, or cancer cure, and, and there may never be uh, during this era. But I think as technology gets better, as our operation gets better, as we're able to collect the data and study it better, I think we will have improvements. And I think the next step is really intraoperative imaging. It would be great to see these tumors during surgery and to be able to um, know how close they are to the capsule so that we can do these partial nerve sparings um, better and more accurately. So I think uh, that's, that's the key here. So I'll stop our share now. And so <clears throat> hopefully uh, you enjoyed uh, this, uh, this discussion and um, this is our experience with prostatectomy from the beginning. I think I would say if you're starting, um, Keep a database, follow your outcomes, uh, study other people who are uh, doing these procedures well, pick a mentor and then follow that technique for quite some time until you become quite good at it and then start adding your own nuances to it. Um, there's still a long way to go, but I think we've made some great strides over the last uh, few years and I think uh, we will continue to improve. Um, thank you so much.